So really pleased to have Ge, so take it away and let's welcome Ge. Thank you, Percy, and thanks to all of you for having me. I'm just gonna jump right in and talking about music and AI, what do we really want? And uh, I'll just start with this uh, statement, which I, I wonder how many of you will resonate with, that we, for better or worse, do live in interesting times. This, of course, being the confusion curse. Times during which I personally have no answers, but a lot of questions, and only questions, perhaps. And so what I want to do today is to tell maybe a story about music and AI. But also, it will be a kind of provocation for a set of questions that we could all be asking and asking together about what do we really want. So a bit about how I got here, and I guess my background will, be, will come into relevance a little bit later in the talk, is that I'm, well, I'm a, I am a designer. I'm a tool builder. Um, I create programming languages for music, musical instruments for laptop orchestra, instruments for mobile phones and, and tablets, uh, work on VR, and I'll also work on uh, interactive AI um, with systems with humans in the loop. Um, Chuck is a programming language I've been working on since grad school. Um, I end up, all my degrees are actually in computer science, uh, from undergrad to PhD. My appointment right now here at Stanford is in music with a courtesy appointment in computer science. And Chuck is an open source programming language for making sounds and music. And this is the aforementioned Stanford Laptop Orchestra, or SLORC. Uh, once upon a time, there was the mobile Stanford Mobile Phone Orchestra. That was MOFO, M-O-P-H-O. This is the VR lab. We're about to start a new Stanford VR orchestra, SVORC. Uh, basically, it's what my advisor would call name-driven research. We do a lot of it. And uh, aforementioned Ocarina. Now, I designed this back in 2008, and, um, and I thought maybe I'll give you a, just a demo of it. And um, part of me still can't believe I'm, I'm still demoing this thing 15 years later, but here we are. You play this by blowing into your phone, and you control the pitch by the different buttons on the screen. Accelerometer controls vibrato, right? For example, so, thank you very much. And uh, this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. It's audio, it's visual, it's interactive. The circles are run down the middle of the screen. Those are prompting you to how to play the next note. But the sound is not recorded, but synthesized live. And that's very important in Ocarina because, it, you know, it actually gives you room to actually make the performance your own. There's a degree of open expression that we value, that we keep in things like Ocarina. And then there's another dimension in Ocarina, which it's a globe. You can listen to, to people uh, blown to their phones from around the world. Who is that playing O Shenandoah from the East Coast? I don't know, the app was not designed to tell you. In fact, I'm more accurate, I would say the app was designed to not tell you. Because not knowing, we thought, would make you wonder. Who's that playing? Legend of Zelda from Indonesia. We don't know. So this is kind of an anonymous social network uh, based on music, the globe. And I think a question for this, and with everything that my students and I design, it's, it's, it is a question of what, it is the question of how, it is a question of for whom, and of course, it's the question of why. Why was something like Ocarina Design? So this is, well, I, this is more of a confession. Uh, nobody asked for this, and this solves no problems that exist. But we put a lot of effort in building this. We put as much engineering and grace as we can muster 
in, in putting this. Oh, oh, thank you very much. And so in some ways, I'm a computer scientist who does st strange computer science things. Um, and I, I, I'm a problem solver who solves problems that, that nobody asked to be solved. Um, but maybe I design from something else other than, I guess, kind of this notion of need. I, I think we all have needs. There's, there are things in life that are just necessary. But you know, underlying a lot of the needs, I think we can find things that we would call values, things that are really important to us. And I should say Ocarina was not designed out of need. It's not like we ask people, hey, people were designing an app. What do you need? And people are like, we need to blow into our phones to make music. We need to hear one another blow into their, no, it didn't happen that way. This was just designed out of a simple but deep belief that music making is good. But also, within a digital medium, such as the phone, it's possible to make things still physical, organic, something that is about what's on the screen, but also about your physicality that you put into actually playing the thing. And maybe this other ethos, which we'll credit to Mark Weiser, who was the CTO of uh, Xerox Park some decades ago. And he often is thought of as one of the forerunners of ubiquitous computing. He thought that technology should create calm. And I think this is a remarkable statement. It's not where technology necessarily is today. One could argue, in fact, it'd be pretty easy to find ways in which technologies are, is not creating calm. Um, but this is a nice and somewhat surprising sentiment, especially for this age, in that technology isn't necessarily here just to solve all our problems or try to create wealth, but that it could bring us some kind of inner peace. So in many ways, that's the different ways that I kind of, I guess, exist <laughs> in the world in different modes. You know, one side is very much just tech. I write code. I've been writing code daily for almost, oh gosh, probably since the beginning of grad school, since going back to undergrad. That's like almost like 30 years. So I'm just, I love coding. Uh, I love designing tools. Um, but maybe on the other side of it is I love to, uh, well, I've come to love to go into the great outdoors. Um, Truth be told, I really prefer the couch. I prefer the gaming chair. But in 2021, after being indoors for very long, after sheltering in place, my partner Madeline was like, "Guh, we gotta go to the great outdoors. And I said, the couch is fine. She's like, "Guh, we're going to the great outdoors. I'm like, okay. And I reluctantly joined her on a long hike. This is a 21 day hike the epic John Muir Trail right here in California. It rarely dips below 8,000 feet in elevation. It goes over seven real mountain passes, going up as high as about 14, over 14,000 feet. And uh, well, this whole experience was, well, it was an experience. Showers, those are not an option. Mosquitoes, those are not optional. Right? And there are moments of great sublimity. Not a lot, but a few moments. Like when we got to Evolution Lake after a day of getting ourselves up near pass, a very, very arduous climb. And then there, and then there was a thunderstorm we tried to outrun that failed. Uh, I met more mosquitoes than I ever have in life at Wanda Lake. Uh, everything all kind of settled by 5.30. The sun came out, and there was a double rainbow. That was, that was sublime. Now, I did think with this thought experiment, say, if you had dropped me, like airlifted me, and just helicoptered me into evolution, like, would I still feel the same? And I think the answer is no. So these rocks that I, if I complain about, because they hurt my, my feet every day for 21 days, they're going to come back later in this talk, because has to do with what I, where I'm getting at. And by the way, it does remind me of memes such as this one. So not long ago, y'all remember when the internet was an escape from the real world? Y'all remember this time? Today, some might argue the real world is an escape from the internet. You know, we live the high-tech existence, and this was trying to be low-tech, but life maybe could be high. And the other side to me is just using the tools we make to make art. 
and to help other people make art. So kind of creating and making art is part of just who I am. And all of that is just part of life, which I don't see that differently from, from work, from play. And I feel very fortunate that I could say that. But however you think about this word life, I think it is inextricably con connected to this whatever design is. And that's what design is to me. It's actually something that cannot be separated from life. And this is why I did write the aforementioned book, Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime. But I did just write a book, a conventional book, which I started to do. Then I remember all the comic books I read as a kid. So, and I was like, maybe I can make a few pages in comic form. But before I knew it, the whole book became a 488-page photo comic book that asked the following questions. What is the nature of design? Who does it? What does it mean to design well? And in this age of so much technology, what does it mean to design ethically? Right? And it's actually with this lens that I taught a new course, actually this past winter quarter, Music and AI. And it was a critical making course, meaning that this is a course in which you build a lot of things with AI tools, toys, instruments. But also, we're going to try our best to think as broadly as possible about the implications and the ramifications of the things that we make. Right? Lecture one began as titled, is, is this even a good idea? And this is actually the part of the critical part. It's, of course, referring to you know, the ways in which we apply AI or potentially apply AI to the various endeavors within music. But it was also, quite honestly, a question I had about teaching this course. Is this course even a good idea? Um, and right off the bat, we said, you know, in this course, answers are great, but questions are greater. Because answers are an endpoint. But a good question, now that is continually generative. So the ability to frame good questions actually is, that's what I really want people to take away from this course. And as James Baldwin once wrote, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. And with something like AI, I feel like that's triply true, right? You can go into mid-journey and, and, and just prompt, and you can, you can make something that's way better than I could ever hope to draw, I, I guess. But what does it mean, right? We have to unpack that for ourselves. So for me, I think this is the ethos that this course was... Uh, was really founded on, and really that's the overriding question, what do we really want from AI? And it's this idea that every AI system that we, that all of you, that any of us actually makes, right? I think we can see that as an argument or even as a vote for the future, a vote for how we would want to live with AI. That is actually the power I think we have, for better and for worse, to design systems for AI. And also in the class, we tried hard to question the foregone premises, not foregone conclusions, but foregone premises. Assumptions that we make about AI that we may, maybe need to take a step back and re-examine. Things like anything that should be automated, anything that could be automated should be automated. Is that always the case? When is the, what is the counterexample to that? Or progress in AI should be measured by how indistinguishable AI is from humans. Hmm. And by the way, this is related to the Turing trap, and I won't say very much about that because the author of the Turing trap, uh, Eric, will be speaking in the very next session. But I will say that the Turing trap for us has been a very important lens in actually generating more questions. You know, for us in the class, certainly it is about jobs. It's about kind of societal. It's about power. It's about production. But also, it's about this question of how do we measure our progress in AI, right? Is it just now that AI can do things that we like to do, is that, like, to what extent is that progress? And is, are there other ways that we could measure and benchmark AI? Third premise we often question, making things more convenient slash less frustrating is always desirable. Hmm. Can we think of counterexamples to that? I'm going to try to provide some in a bit, but let's go ahead back to this question. What do we really want from AI? I mean, do we... It's easy to think about, just like, maybe we just want a big red button. And sometimes I would say, like, yeah, there, there are certain cases where I wouldn't mind a big red button. But there are other cases 
well, I want something different, something more. And just think about all the ways you could potentially interact with instruments. It's just a small subset of things you could do. You can press, you can slide, you can twist, you can turn, you can shake, you can pluck, you can bow, you can pull, you can strike, and much more. So what are the different interfaces we can actually have with this? So with this, I'll show you some of the student work and, and, and give you a sense of how we think about this. And students, by the way, came from all kinds of different backgrounds, but I feel like we all had one thing in common, all of us, whether you're from music, or computer science, and even including the instructor. I think we all realized we had some form of AI FOMO. Oh, yes. Do you have AI FOMO? This question, by the way, only works inside Silicon Valley. If I, I've given this, not this talk, but many talks like this where I try to ask, how many people in the room have AI FOMO? Expecting most of the hands to shoot up as they would in like, it'd be like 10% maybe. You even know what I'm talking about. People are like, what, what, what am I missing out on? But here, at Stanford, here in Silicon Valley, it feels like AI FOMO is, is quite a real thing. Do you, it's, it's, I mean, an example is, is my, my grad students would come to me and be like, hey, guh, uh, should I have been taking deep learning courses the last three or four years? I mean, I didn't want to. I just wanted to make my music. But now I feel like, am I going to get left behind? And that is AI FOMO. And it was AI FOMO that I even taught the class because I was like, well, hey, I'm a, should I be teaching class on AI and music? I, maybe. Why not just do it? So I actually went into the class knowing that I had some trepidation and fear of missing out. Anyway, the three homework assignments and a final project, I'll show you just a sampling of each. First one is to make a kind of a human-guided, poetry, semi-generated tool with sound and time. So uh, here's an example. This is actually using um, just a you know, pretty standard dictionary of 400,000 terms uh, arranged basically by similarity. And, but in this case, Andrew is actually navigating this high dimensional space with an interface and controlling. What does this mean? I have no idea. What the heck is Goten? Gotten? Let's see. Moving up. Wanshen? What does it mean? I don't know, it's poetry. But it's sound, it's image. Now there's a beat. Okay, I can get with this. And you keep going. This thing gets really kind of like unhinged. Especially when Susan Reamer at BaltSun.com. Because she's in this dictionary too. Okay. What does it mean? I don't know, but Andrew made this and he was performing it. And there's something to that. And maybe this is our way of saying maybe there's a lot more to AI than, than generative, because it always has been. And we think about tools, and we think about oracles. We think about when we want oracles and when we want tools, and thinking the two are actually not the same. There might be a world of difference. There is a world of difference between oracles that just tell you, presumably, the answer, and a tool that you have to learn to get good at using. You have to put time and effort into learning. Uh, another assignment was called Weckinator World. It reads, in this programming A2, you're to use Weckinator to create three interactive AI utilities toys in your everyday life. These don't have to be useful. In fact, whimsical is good, absurd is good, playful is wonderful. Weckinator is a, is, is a framework created by uh, Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink, who is, uh, to me, she's one of the world's experts on AI, human-computer interaction, and music. Uh, she teaches in London, and she is the author of Weckinator, which is an interactive machine learning framework where you can kind of teach and map interaction and, and map interaction by example. Here's a simple example that, well, this is WaveBot. That's all it does. In many ways, <laughs> sometimes she, she would still to this day, I think, speak of what I've heard is the small data mindset, right? What is the small data? Well, this is a rhyme I made up for class that I ask my students to repeat. You can do a lot with a lot of data. You can do a lot with not a lot of data. It kind of flows, right? You can do a lot with a lot of data. You can do a lot with not a lot of data, right? To so say, like, actually, a lot of data can be very useful, but there are ways to be creative with not a lot of data. 
So here's some examples. Uh, <laughs> here's, um, <clears throat> here's Matt's com social commentary. That's all it does. But that's all it needs to do, arguably. So students have to write up reflections, and this is what Matt wrote, and this is how it ended. He wrote a lot, and this is just the last paragraph. So I really enjoyed this assignment. I think it's easy to adopt this toxic, capitalistic mindset that everything you do or make has to be productive or for something. But when we follow that dogma, we forget to make beautiful things just because they're beautiful, do funny things just because they're funny, or make stupid projects just because they're stupid. There's so much beauty in doing things just because. It was nice to take a pause in life and make something just for the sake of making it, and for a grade, but that's more of an afterthought. Here's Angela, speaking of body-based inter interfaces. I mean, we're using state-of-the-art AI techniques that was state-of-the-art like 15 years ago, which means they're completely ancient today. But yet, but yet, you know, it was actually teaching music and AI back this January, February was like a crazy time to be teaching this class for the first time with all the things that was just happening. ChatGPT just went viral a few months before that. Somewhere in the middle of the class, music LM released and, and like the people who are actually working on AI based synthesis, right? We're just like, what? We thought this would be like five years away. Can't believe it's here already. But we just couldn't for the life of us not figure out, maybe we will, but we can't figure out how to use these larger systems to make the things that we want to make because the things I mean, how do you use LLMs to make something like this? This is hand synth. Pitch is mapped to the direction and extent. Yeah, so <laughs> what do we learn from all this? Some things. One, I, we, the course became kind of a community and we, it was kind of a, therapy for our, our collective AI FOMO. It was also running commentary about AI and AI education in this time. And maybe it's, especially at Stanford, right? And we, we concluded that, you know, it, it's not really about intelligence. Not really. You know, as faculty, we have a saying here about our students sometimes behind closed doors. It's not that scathing because it just goes smart in, smart out. Because there's not a single person on this campus who's not smart. Everybody is super smart and intelligent. But if not intelligence, what might this be about? Well, intelligence we could define in artificial intelligence or any other context. We could say intelligence, working definition, might be possessing the means to achieve what you desire. Let's work with that. Let's just put that as a proposition out there, is what intelligence could entail. But this other word, wisdom, is something we could then define as the capacity to critically evaluate your desires in the first place and the means that you would have to achieve your desires. Right? This, I think, is the hidden, 
the truly, the, the thing that is, that is actually unseen, that is invisible, right? Is, you know, intelligence is actually very, like, upfront, noticeable, visible. But wisdom is, is, is hidden. And so, and the way I think, you know, you, you try to be wiser is to actually, among other things, frame the questions and, and to use that question as a lens to see what's happening all around you in the smallest of details. And at the same time, I think there's, I think it's okay for those of us who are having a crisis of faith about the current times, about AI, about what we're gonna do as academics, for example. I think it's okay, because I'd rather be in crisis, I'd rather even be jaded than to be complacent. And I have to ask the following questions. Right? What if, just what if the whole point of music, of art, is that we make it? Think about that. You know, I mean, have you noticed? I mean, I think, well, maybe we have noticed, some of us anyway, that the people doing a lot of the AI research work, or the people that are excited about music and AI, aren't really, aren't musicians <laughs> or artists, right? And all the artists I know and, and, and can really respect, like, I mean, I guess I'm here as a kind of emissary, though nobody appointed me ambassador, but I'm gonna try to play that role anyway. And I said, I think all the artists I know <laughs> don't want generative AI. Like, actively don't want it. And I don't wanna speak for everyone. There are those who, who maybe are willing to try. I'm, I'm certainly willing to try, but, and the reason I think a lot of them don't, this is my take, is that it's not the fear of being just replaced, but because the reason for being replaced is that the system we're in might be just okay, or isn't looking for good, was never looking for good, it's just looking for good enough, good enough to monetize, right? And, and, and in that world, we would get things that are serviceable enough, right, out of our tools, but the sublime is gonna be in shorter and shorter order. The things that really make us feel and make us question. And I wonder, I wonder, are we entering in this early chapter, that we step into this new chapter of generative AI, in the history of AI and technology and of, and of humankind, I would say, like, are we entering an age of generic, right? Where the serviceable supplants the sublime. And I have to remind you, because I, I, am, I, I am part of the leadership here at HAI, that third tenet of, of Stanford HAI is all application, AI applications should augment human capabilities, not replace humans. What if, and this is another big one, what if being confused and frustrated is, is an essential part of learning and learning anything? Like, think about the things you really are glad you learned and how difficult and frustrating and confusing that was, right? I talk about type one and type two suffering. It's kind of like type one and type two fun. What's, what are those things? Type one fun is the thing you're just having a great time in the moment. Type two fun was like, is actually like, you're miserable in the moment. But in the aggregate, you're like, I'm glad I did that. John Muir trail for me. 98% was going up hill, going down a mountain, rocks under my feet, mosquitoes all around me. But those moments in between, those 2%, it makes me miss the whole experience. It makes me glad I did that. And I think learning is more like type two suffering. It's a suffering you kind of buy into. And you have to kind of work with a difficulty and, and overcome it to actually, well, perhaps learn, right? And so I guess this is my final question I wanna leave all of us with is, you know, what if all things worthwhile are mountains to climb, right? And this is where those rocks do come back. Because <laughs> I think about that, and I think that is kind of an analogy for, for this. So I have no answers, only questions. Um, I do, I see I'm out of time. I'm gonna fast forward. All of this is not important right now. But I do wanna get to my final slide. And it is this, this final paragraph from Andrew, who did the <laughs> initial poetry 
To conclude, he was writing at the end of the course, I'm grateful to the class providing a supportive environment for experimental AI in creative and unorthodox ways. Like many, I felt AI FOMO at the start, worrying over how I could incorporate AI into my research as if that were the only way to feel validated. But now, after 10 weeks of using AI to make utter ridiculousness, a uh, text-to-speech drum machine, face to smash, I'm over it. I'm tired of bending over backwards to try to make it work in creative scenarios where human skill and sensitivity feels more natural. AI has been firmly dislodged in my mind from being the holy grail that many have presented it as. It's honestly a huge relief. But wait, now that expectations have been let go, do I find myself feeling excited again, maybe even hopeful? Whatever the feeling is, it's not obligation or FOMO, nor is it aversion. Even when I do use AI again in my work, I'm confident it will be because I want to, not because someone says I ought to. I won't slam shut the door to AI, just like I won't leave it wide open. Instead, I feel content now to remain open-minded. Hang tight to that oh-so-important question, what do we really want from it all? Thank you all very much. Wow, that was a very cleansing talk. It's uh, meditative. Um, so um, um, we have time for maybe one quick question that we should move on. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I want to make myself voice for everyone. Thank you for unpacking so many important connections between creativity love, feelings, ideas, and technology. I've admired you for 15 years. I was uh, one of the first Ocarina players. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one part of that story that I want everyone else to know. A year after the app was released, I heard Steve Jobs talk about the Ocarina app. And Steve said, it was first when I saw the Ocarina app on the App Store that I realized the power of this App Store and the kind of creativity that it will unleash globally. So thank you for what you've done and for what you continue to do. Thank you. Wow.